Great time of celebration. A lot of things to celebrate. Family. We can celebrate family, right? That's what we do in the holiday season. We can celebrate our culture and we can celebrate our traditions during the holiday season. Gift giving. We celebrate giving gifts. Every time you turn the TV on, every time you look over here or look over there, or I walked in this morning and everyone's exchanging envelopes and cards and gifts. What a great thing to be able to do. And of course, then there's Santa Claus. We don't want to forget about celebrating Santa Claus. He's a pretty big, important part of our season, isn't he? Some people like to just celebrate the winter season. You know, snow, lots of rain, sleigh bells. And how about we can't forget Jack Frost nipping at our nose? You know, there's a song about Jack Frost. It's called The Christmas Song. Did you know that? That song about Jack Frost is called The Christmas Snow, or The Christmas uh, Song. And, you know, when we talk about Jack Frost, we're talking about celebrating winter. We're talking about tiny tots with their eyes all aglow, celebrating family. How about Yuletide carols being sung by a choir, turkey, ham, mistletoe, celebrating family traditions? And they all know that Santa's on his way. He's bringing lots of toys and goodies in his sleigh. And so we get to celebrate gift giving. You know, all of the things that the Christmas song talks about, we're able to celebrate during the Christmas season. But you know, the Christmas song doesn't make one mention of Jesus Christ. Not one. Oh, it covers all the family stuff and the fun stuff and the traditions and celebrating and gift giving and winter. There's nothing bad about any of those things and there's nothing bad about celebrating those things. But I think, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think that Christmas should primarily be about Jesus and about his birth. And we should celebrate that birth. Imagine for a second. It's your birthday. And people are celebrating all over the place, but they're not celebrating your birthday. They're celebrating their raise they got, or the birth of a child, or their new home, or their new hot tubs, or their toys that they've bought. They're all celebrating something, but it's your birthday. They're celebrating traditions. They're even using this as an occasion to give gifts to other people but they completely ignore you. How would you feel? How would you feel about that? Would that be right? I would think not. I would probably be a little bit hurt if it was my birthday and everybody was partying about something else and nobody ever came and celebrated my birthday. You know, that's what many do with Christmas, though, isn't it? He becomes a very, Jesus does, he becomes a very, very minor almost insignificant piece of Christmas celebration. And so I'm asking myself this morning, well, what should I be celebrating at Christmas? What is this really about? And of course, we all know the answer to that. It's about the birth of Jesus Christ. But is it more than that? Is it more than that? Could it be one of the most important truths in the Bible that God became a man. You know, next to the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate at Easter time, the birth of Christ is right up there in priority with it. If he had not been born, he would not have died. He would not have 
bled for our sins, he would not have risen. He would not have ascended into heaven. We call this the incarnation, when God took on human flesh and became a man and came to this earth. The scripture tells us that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him up in cloths, and she put him in a manger because there was nowhere else for them to go. We all know the story. This last song that we did a few minutes ago talked about the conditions that Jesus was born in in one of the verses. It wasn't a hospital. There weren't doctors all around. It was in a stall, a cave, some may say. You know, I have a stall at my house, and part of my duty is to muck it. That's what I do. I pick up horse stuff, and I clean it out. But you know what? I don't do that every day. I kind of wait until it gets really gnarly, and then I go in and do it especially this time of year. But to think of a little child being born in that stall with all the smells and the stuff that accumulates in there, it gives me a whole different perspective. The place that he was born with other animals and beasts and little Mary Little, young, very young Mary, a virgin, who had never been with another man. She had never had sexual relations with a man, but yet she winds up with child, and she's very young. And I'm sure that there's a little bit of fear going on. This was a miracle. This was a miracle conception. But... One of the things we don't read a whole lot about in this story of the birth of Jesus is what Mary went through. This young little gal. She gave birth to a child and there was nothing abnormal about it. There was nothing special about it. She gave birth to a child just like every one of you mothers have given birth to your children the same exact way. It was a normal process of labor. Her water broke. She had contractions. She was feeling overwhelmed by what was going on in her body. Her back hurt. She took a long ride on a donkey. Could you imagine that, ladies, when you're ready to give birth, to get on a donkey and go for a ride? That'd probably bring it on, wouldn't it? It doesn't sound very exciting. It doesn't sound very homogenized. It doesn't sound very beautiful when you look at it from that, from that idea. There's a lot of work involved. I'm so glad I'm a man and not a woman. Aren't you men? I don't hear you. Yes, they are. Just for the record, they are. And as she's she's going through this process that every woman goes through, the child is born. And you know, it didn't glow. He didn't have a glow about him. He wasn't abnormal. There was nothing about his appearance that would make mama or daddy or anybody think that he was special. He was a normal little baby. He came into the world just like you and I. He came into the world through his mother's strong efforts. Beautiful little baby. What's the point? Well, the point is this. He was a normal baby. He was born in a normal way. He really was a human being. He was the Son of God. You know, when you read the Old Testament, you read story in the Old Testament about how the sons of God came down to the daughters of men. And they had relations with these women and they gave offspring. And what winds up happening through that effort 
of these fallen angels, if you will, these sons of God. The world had to be washed. It had to be cleansed. There had to be a restart, if you will. Because not even angels are able to produce the Son of God. Only God can do that. That's why the Bible tells us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. It's His only true offspring. And oh, there's been lots of times throughout history, even we read in the Bible about those who have tried to do that. Angels trying to do that. But only God can do that. He was human. And as he grew old, as he grew older, well, think about this. He had dirty diapers. Think about that. Jesus Christ. Somehow or another in my mind, it's just like, oh, he never did that, right? He spit up. He cried when he was hungry. He was totally, completely dependent upon his mother and father to survive for his every need. He could do nothing for himself. Did you know a human baby is one of the most helpless creatures on the earth when it's born? Just about every other species of life on this planet has the ability to go to mama for food, to find that source of food. If you've ever had kittens or puppies or animals that give birth in your at your house or whatever, you see this happen naturally. It's almost like they have an advantage over us. You know, if you were born and they just left you on the table to go find your own bottle or some, something to eat, you wouldn't get very far. None of us would be sitting here today because we're so darn helpless. Now, I wonder if God did that just as a little reminder for humility on our part. We come into this world absolutely helpless and dependent upon someone else. Think about this little baby for a second. Can't talk. You can cry, but that's all. He can't walk. He has to learn to crawl before he can begin to walk. This is a child that had totally normal human needs. And as Jesus began to grow older and the years went by, he continues to exhibit human needs human problems throughout his life. Scripture tells us in the Gospel of John, he became tired. Can you imagine that? Jesus got wore out. He needed a break. That's, that's amazing. Jesus, really? Yeah. And you know what else? He got thirsty. That's right. Just like you and me. Matthew chapter 4 tells us that he was tempted. Just like you and me. To sin. Book of Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that he suffered. Just like you and me. He suffered. He didn't have any secret plan to avoid suffering. He wasn't into the prosperity thing, see. He was into just living life like you and me. Because he knew that he was human just like us. The book of Hebrews tells us that he was like his brothers in every respect. He was totally man, a real baby, God becoming a child. That is what the incarnation means. It's kind of a theological word, I know, but it's a good one to know. It's a good one to understand. It's a good one to, to be able to have in our minds and in our hearts. And you know, Jesus, not only was he human, not only was he a baby, not only did he go through all the things that you went through as you were growing up, he was also God. He was God in the flesh. And how do we know that? How do we know that he was God? A lot of people like to say he was the son of God. A lot of people like to say he was a great teacher. 
A lot of people like to say that he was co-equal with some of the other prophets, some of the other religions around the world who have claimed deity or whatever. But you know what Jesus said about all those? He said, they're all thieves and robbers. Jesus made it clear that he was the only one, the only Messiah, the only Son of God, the only one who had the revelation of life and the cure for our terrible disease that we call sin. You know, while he was on the earth, he claimed to be God. He, he made that claim. Now, you know, if he'd have never made that claim, then we could just say, well, you know, you're just kind of trying to put pieces together here and there and make it look like he was God. But he himself claimed to be God. Now, I think for people today and even people during the time of Jesus, that is a, that's a line in the sand right there. We're good with the idea that he was a great man and a teacher and all of these different things. But boy, I'll tell you, there are some circles when you say Jesus is God, there's a big problem that arises. The Bible tells us very clearly that he was. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John chapter 10, Jesus said, I and the Father are one and the same. We're one. And I'll tell you something, there was no misunderstanding with the audience that heard those words. They knew exactly what he was saying. They picked up stones to stone him, to execute him for blasphemy, because they said, because you being a man, make yourself to be God. They knew. They understood exactly what Jesus meant. I and the Father are one. Now, there's a lot of people maybe would say something similar. There's a group of people we call pantheists. They just kind of believe all over the place. And they would say that all things are God. All things are one. As a matter of fact, you and I are one with the universe. Doesn't that make you feel comforted this morning? You're one with the universe. But that's not what Jesus was saying, was it? As a matter of fact, the Bible never confuses God with his creation. God, the creation is not God. God created it. He's totally separate from it. Jesus created it. He's totally separate from it. The Bible makes that clear distinction. Jesus is not just saying, I and the Father are one, and you and the Father are one. We're all one. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm unique, speaking of himself. I am God. That's powerful. Very powerful. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 8, Jesus said something astounding. Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. How about that one? That's pretty powerful. He's clearly claiming here to have existed before Abraham. But he's claiming even more than that. Why didn't Jesus say, because Abraham, before he was born, I was? Why did he say, I am? Well, I'm reminded of that visit Moses had on the mount. That visit with that burning bush. And he had a conversation with the Lord. And the Lord was going to send him out to do great things to deliver his people Israel in the book of Exodus, and we all know the story. But when he went to the Lord, and the Lord said, and Moses said, who am I going to say has sent me? You remember what God said to him? He said, I am has sent you. I am that I am. Just tell them that I am has sent you. And once again, Jesus here, making himself equal with God. 
As a matter of fact, in chapter 15 of the same gospel, Jesus said, Who has ever seen me has seen the Father. Whoa, that's really powerful. Think about that. You know, the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. If you were able to see God in all of his glory, we would just dissolve into whatever nothingness. But think about this for a second. He came and he took on human flesh, and you could look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and you could see God. Perhaps not in all of the glory, but perhaps in a way that we could survive it, that we could enjoy it, that we could absorb it into our spirits. He clearly claimed to be God. You know, over the years, over the centuries since, many have claimed to be God. Many have made that claim. Today, when they, people like that make that claim, we generally put them in a mental institution. Or we just write them off as being crazy. So making that claim does not necessarily establish the point, does it? We can make all the claims we want. But you know, those who claim to be God, they never did the things that God can do. But Jesus did. In his ministry, he did the things that only God could do. He fed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. How did that work? I don't know. Only God could do that. Oh, believe me, they weren't all sitting there with their little sack lunch tucked up in their sleeves, and when Jesus broke the fish out, they had this spirit of giving, and everybody broke out their secret stash, and they were, you know, no, that's not how it worked. It's very, very clear. There were a few fish and a few loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 people with it. He turned water into wine. He was in the midst of a storm, and even nature itself obeyed his voice, and he commanded the winds and the waves to be still. Mark says they obeyed him immediately. You ever carry a bucket of water across the yard or the room or the barn or whatever, and you're just kind of sloshing around, and you set it down on the ground, and it doesn't stop sloshing, does it? It keeps moving around in there for a while until it settles down and flattens out. But you know what? That story about Jesus and the wind and the storm and the waves, that's not how that story goes. He commanded it, and instantly it flattened. Instantly the waves stopped and the storm subsided. He was in control of nature itself. He was in control of science. We hear a lot about science these days, don't we? Follow the science. You know, let me tell you something about science for a second. Very interesting topic, isn't it? Science isn't the gospel. Science is not in concrete. Science is ever-changing, ever-moving, ever-evolving. You know, when I was in school, the earth was 10 million years old. And now that I'm grown up, the earth is 25 billion years old. Guess what? I haven't been around that long. But that's what the science said back then. And we believed it. But now they're saying something totally different because science is ever changing, ever evolving. It never comes to a conclusion. So much for that. You know, Jesus, not only could he do these things with nature and science, and, but you know, the Bible says that he created the heavens and the earth. He created all the stars in the heavens. You know what else he did? He forgave sins. Do you know that he forgave sins before he was crucified. Did you know that? Some would think that that's impossible because his blood hadn't been shed yet, so the forgiveness of sins had not yet been enacted, but he forgave sins. Do you remember the man who was paralyzed? 
And they went to him to pray for him, and they couldn't get in. Or they brought him to Jesus, and he was in a house, and it was so crowded, they couldn't get in. So what did they do? They tore part of the roof off and lowered him down to, to, to Jesus. And he was paralyzed. He'd been in this bed. We've seen people that are paralyzed like that. Very painful existence. And as he's lowered down in the cot, down in front of everybody, Jesus said to him, what would you like me to do for you, son? Well, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? I'd like you to touch me and heal my body, of course. That's why I'm here. But you know what he did? He said, your sins are forgiven you. That's what he did. Easy to say, isn't it? It's easy for someone to say, your sins are forgiven you. And they mocked him. They made fun of him. They teased him. The scribes, the Pharisees, the religious elite were present. And this is what they said. Who can forgive sin but God alone? What's the answer to that? No one. Only God can forgive sin. And just to show that this man's sin was forgiven, just to show that Jesus had the power to forgive sin, he backed it up by healing this man. I can't see that your sin is forgiven. I can't see that happen. But I can see if you're paralyzed and you get up and walk. And so Jesus healed him to prove that he had the power, to prove who he was, yes, I can forgive sin because, yes, I am God. In the book of Hebrews, he tells us that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the glory of God shining through. He displays God's attributes, attributes in ways that no one else ever has or ever will. And finally, we have this phrase that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Wow. He not only created everything, but he holds it together. He sustains it. Aren't you glad? He holds all things together by his power, by his might. And the author of the book of Hebrews is clearly declaring, yes, Jesus is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, we saw that earlier this morning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus pre-existed the creation. He was here before the creation. But more than that, He was God from the very beginning. John 1, 3 tells us all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was the active agent of God's creation, and apart from him, nothing has come into existence, only because of him. And then down in verse 14, I love this, the word which is God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And yes, Jesus was a man. And yes, Jesus is God also. The only God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has ever seen God. Now listen, this is John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who was at the Father's side. He has made him known. Look at that verse for a second. When John says the only God who is at the Father's side, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, isn't he? It has to be Jesus. No one's ever seen God the Father, but Jesus, who is God also, is at the side of the Father and has shown us what God is like. And when we see Jesus, we see the Father. 
I want to go back a little bit to the idea of him being a child because that's what we're celebrating this week. These teeny little infant hands. I remember when my kids were first born and even my grandkids. You know how the little ones, they like to grab your finger and hold on to it, right? With them little teeny tiny hands. He's holding on to Mary's finger. And you know what? That very same hand created all the stars. That voice that cried out moments after his birth, that same voice named each of those stars. I want to tell you about one of those stars, just one, because I'm one of these guys that loves astronomy, and I think it's very, very cool. There's one called the Pistol Star, and it's near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 100 times bigger than our sun. It's 200 million miles wide. In other words, if it was positioned at the center of our sun, the pistol star is so big that it would absorb our earth too. It's that big. It would fry us. We would be consumed by it. And its position is in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. And those little hands fashioned and formed and brought into being the pistol star. You see, this morning, I want you to understand, I want you to comprehend the tremendous truth of the incarnation of God. The incarnation. We get so used to the words Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate, God in the flesh, rolls off my lips. And I hardly ever think about the greatness of the things that I'm even saying. It's so easy to lose that. It's so easy to dilute that. The one who made this star makes that star totally insignificant compared to his glory. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. John told us, God is light and in him is no darkness. Jesus said to us, you are the light of the world. Light must be pretty important. You know, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. I don't know about you, but my brain fried when I started thinking about that one. 186,000 miles per second. That's pretty fast. Pretty powerful. It tells us that the light of God is purifying, that it's more brilliant than the sun. When the transfiguration happened, and Moses and Elijah appeared on that mountain with Jesus, and he was in his glory, and Peter and James and John got to witness that. He was brighter than the sun, he is light. And he has given us that light. He has all glory and power and purity and praise. He's worthy. But yet he became despised. He became rejected, helpless. The one who was before the world began has become a tiny, insignificant speck in the world. Why did God become man? Why? Could you imagine if Jesus had never come? Could you imagine if salvation had not been made available to us? You and I would still be in our sin. You and I would be hopeless. We would have no help. We would never be able to be accepted by God. In Hebrews 2, verse 14, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who had the power of death, and that is the devil, and deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. 
He helps the Gentiles. He helps you and me. He didn't die for the angels, the fallen angels. He died for you and me. Jesus is our representative. He is our high priest. He's the payment for your sin. Apart from the incarnation, the Satan would always be able to say throughout eternity, you're dirty. You'll never make it. You're doomed. But this morning we have hope. This morning we have the faith to know that through his incarnation and through his death, he took away the power of death. We sinned, yes. And our sin is our own. And Satan is right. We are guilty. We do deserve God's wrath. We do deserve hell. But this morning, I want to share the good news. The gospel. That's what this is all about today. We all know the story of the birth, but it means so much more to you and me in an eternal sense. If Jesus would not have come, you and I would be doomed forever in our own sin. So should we respond this morning? How should we respond? How should we respond if we're watching on TV or wherever you're watching from this morning? How would you respond to these truths? We could say, well, you know, that's very interesting. That's very historically interesting and very intellectual, too. I kind of like that deep thinking. I've only been to the Grand Canyon one time. And when I went there to the Grand Canyon and I stood there, well, there's a visitor center. And you can go in there and you can see pictures of it and history and all that. And you can take pictures of the pictures. And then you walk out and you get in your car and you drive away. And you say, well, that was very, very interesting, wasn't it? No, you cannot grasp the scope of the Grand Canyon from looking at a picture. You have to see it with your own eyes. You have to take it in. You have to look at that and say, oh my gosh, that is unbelievable. I'm responding in wonder and amazement. Sometimes people like to just take that quick snapshot of Jesus. He was a cool dude. He's a good man. He teaches us great morals. He's so much more. He's so much more. God became man. He became man and he fulfilled the very purposes of the creation of man. He glorified God in his whole life and then he died young. His ministry was going great. He was traveling to and fro, preaching the good news. But his time had come to lay his life down for our sins. Maybe this morning you don't feel like you're good enough to accept God's forgiveness. You're right. But the good news is that God does accept you. Right where you are this morning. Maybe for some, repenting would force us to admit that we really don't have our act together. We really don't know the answers to the questions of life. Maybe, maybe I've made a mess of my life and I can't seem to fix it. Maybe if I follow Jesus, maybe I'll have to give up so many parts of my life that I enjoy the most. You know, without Jesus, all of those things just result in death. All of those things are passing away. And until you really do come to know the Lord, you really are missing out on life. You really are missing out on a whole new perspective of life. And so this morning we celebrate this upcoming day of Christmas. 
Jesus said in John 6.35 that he was the bread of life. He is our provision. He is our sustenance. He nourishes our spirit. And in John 8, he tells us that he's the light of the world. He gives light to us to find our way to God so that we can see clearly in our life. He's also the good shepherd. Now, if he's the good shepherd, think about it. If he's the good shepherd, this must mean that there are some bad shepherds out there. Huh? Some evil shepherds lurking about. Maybe they're wolves in sheep's clothing. But Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. You can trust me. He is the provision made by God whereby we may enter into, that we might step into the door of God's presence. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said he was the true vine and that we were the branches. All of the nourishment, all the sustenance, the growth, the fruit bearing, everything comes from the vine to the branch. You know, he talks about that when he talks about having those branches cut off. What good are they once they're cut off? They lay there and they dry up and they die because they're separated from the vine. They're separated from the source. But Jesus is that true vine. And we are the branches. The great confession of Peter, do you remember? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thomas, his confession, my Lord and my God. There's no doubt that Jesus is the visible image of the creator of the universe. He is God. And this week, when you're around the tree or with your family, eating all the cookies and the sweets and the goodies, try to remember. Try to keep these thoughts in your mind and in your family circle as you spend time together. That this child that was born in such a normal fashion was the one who fashioned all things. He is God. He is our Savior. He lives eternally. And you and I can have a relationship, a personal relationship with him. Let's have the worship team come on back up. You guys got a couple more songs you're going to share with us. You know, holiday season is sometimes difficult when it comes to sharing with you. Because I always get this feeling like, okay, now you've done 12 Christmas messages now? How many others are there left? How do you come up with something unique? That's very difficult. And so this morning, I just wanted to bring this to you from a little bit different perspective so that we could see the humanness of Jesus, the frailty as a child, and the victory. We're going to be celebrating that in a few months, aren't we? That victory of rising from the dead, making our salvation secure. Father, We're so thankful for for you sending Jesus, for you so loved the world, that you sent your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, we desire that life this morning, that relationship with you. Lord, that we might become the fulfillment of your creation that we might become the people that you created us to be, that our spirits would long for you, that our priorities in our life would be towards you. We know, Lord, that if we seek you, that you will add all of these things in our lives, that you will bless our lives. So, Lord, I just want to pray that 
each heart here today, each heart listening, that we might come to that place where perhaps we should refresh our relationship. Or to that place, Lord, where perhaps we should start that relationship. I just pray for each and every one of us that our hearts, Lord, would be touched during this season with all of the commercialism and all the stuff going on around us. God, help us to focus on the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. Lord, we glorify you. We love you. We thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.